So it's an episode one, 2018. It's the 24th of August, and this is Take It EV. So welcome to our EV listening podcast. I'm your host Greg, and and I'm your other host Phil. EV is in the name, so this is the show where we talk about electric vehicles. But we also get into self-driving cars and other forms of futuristic, sustainable transport, like the Hyperloop. Oh, like the Hyperloop. We'll even touch on solar and other forms of sustainable energy. Yeah, but mostly about cars, right? I'm uh, mostly about cars and robots. As we recall this on the 24th of August 2018, Elon Musk has spent a lot of the news over the last couple of months. He seems to be desperately trying to prove the old saying that there's no such thing as bad publicity. Some, including Elon himself, think there's been a bit of a vendetta against him as Tesla gets into the critical production phase of its Model 3s. I think it's fair to say that he can be his own worst enemy when he gets too near social media. So the uh, the latest news comes not directly from Elon, however. Apparently, a former Tesla employee has been posting some of his experiences on an obscure forum, and it's blown up on the Twitters. Uh, the gist of it is that the uh, onboard computer system in the Teslas appears to be designed along similar lines to a typical enterprise software. This is not reassuring news to anyone familiar with the development of the enterprise software. <laughs> Well, I'm not sure how much to read into this yet, but it does raise the old old question of how much we'll be able to trust the software running self-driving vehicles in the possibly near future. Oh, well, but we're getting ahead of ourselves, right? Well, while we'll comment on the latest news in EVs and beyond, this is a show about everyday usage of EVs right now by real people. So if you're listening to this and you don't have an EV yet, this might just give you the perspective from the ground that you've been looking for. So we're not going to be talking about Elon. <laughs> <laughs> he, he might make an appearance. Ah, I love that guy anyway. I love crazy people sometimes. I wonder how many Tesla-related podcasts actually um, have been recording today and uh, just missed the mark on that news. <laughs> I don't know if I really call it news, but... Well, we used to have, you know, AFPs and whatever other news agencies, and nowadays we just have Twitter. Yeah. As this is the uh, the podcast about electric cars from a British and the European perspective, we should probably just say something about ourselves, right? Yeah. Um, how about we start with yourself as you're the most experienced uh, EV driver here? You've got you, you had your cars for longer than I had. I think. I have. I've had mine for two years. Oh, okay. Well, I've, I've I've driven mine since January 2016. So you win, I think. Ooh. Well, and I'll, I'll, spe- I'll, I'll speak briefly about myself then. At some point in the past, I had the pleasure of test driving a Tesla, believe it or not. That was my first electric car that I've driven. I uh, I couldn't afford it at the time. Uh, not that I can now. Uh, <laughs> and I think about a year and a half later, my diesel car, I know, started failing quite a bit, even though it was only four years old. I have decided to look around for something different. Since I moved into London, EV was obviously a fashionable thing at the time. And I was, you know, I was still blown away about tes- by the Tesla that I've test driven a bit before. And uh, I've sent females around to request a test drives of any EVs, VWs, you know, whatever was out there. And uh, sadly, it was only, um, or sadly, it was only the Nissan garage that actually responded to my request. So I came, I went over to test drive a Nissan Leaf 24 kWh. And uh, it was, a, you know, it was a nice enough car. Looks funny from the outside, obviously, as we all know. <laughs> and uh, it was a nice test drive, but I wasn't blown away by it. One thing I remember about uh, test driving Tesla is how quickly I got into um, into sort of feeling the car and how nippy it was, and I was missing that in the in a, during the test drive. So the uh, we you know we were testing, we were driving around, and uh, the salesman at some point just uh, tells me, "Well, turn right this way," and he said, "Stop," and um, he started explaining things some things to me, and then he said, "Well, you see this green button on the steering wheel? That's this eco. Press that." 
and um, make sure you know your steering wheel straight and all that, and just press the uh, the acceleration pedal as hard as you can, and just brace yourself. <laughs> and you know, it wasn't obviously a ludic- ludicrous mode or anything like that. But I was blown away, <laughs> and basically I was sold right there. <laughs> I just you know for the context, I previously have been driving a diesel two liter diesel Vauxhall Insignia, and it was a you know pretty beefy car I thought and that Nissan Leaf just blew it in terms of at least the acceleration you know the first 0 to 20 the the the, uh, the, the famous 0 to 20 acceleration that everyone's quoting in the literature well I think you're all talk <laughs> yeah so the next thing actually the, the next great thing about Nissan's is that they they let you off the car for a weekend if you're interested and I think I drove it to Leicester and back I had procured uh, an ecotricity card so, because uh, obviously the 24 uh, kilowatt hour Nissan is unable to do more than, you know, about 60 miles when you drive it on a motorway, especially since you don't, if you don't have an experience. And that was pretty much it. I think I, uh, I traded in my, my Insignia about a month later and uh, I became an owner of the newly released shiny uh, 30 kilowatt hour Nissan Leaf. And, I was, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was very nice. I was, I was, you know, I was amazed and I'm still amazed about that car. Um. <laughs> the funny thing is, it's got a name. Nice. Um, it's named Alice, and uh, the story is actually quite pretty funny because um, I was supposed to send a text with the with the um, with the image to my girlfriend at the time, now wife, and instead of uh, writing "It's alive," uh, the uh, the infamous iPhone iOS uh, uh, spell checker corrected me to <laughs> "It's Alice," and you know, it just stuck. So it's Alice. It is Alice indeed, yeah. Did you get a response back saying it's Bob? <laughs> nice to know your messages are encrypted, at least. <laughs> yeah, the, the name Bob is actually reserved for something else, but that might be a, um, a, a subject for a, for a different podcast. I look forward to that one. <laughs> one day, <clears throat> in about a year time. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's the short, very short story of me transitioning uh, to an EV. Okay, nice. Well, that's given me time to rem- remember what my story is. Uh, actually, I think it, it starts about 13, 14 years ago. Now I come to think of it. I was I was actually living in Florida. I was there for six months um, on company expenses. So I had a, a rental car the whole time and went through a couple of the you know, cheaper rental automatics in the States, which of course are, are terrible when you've been used to manual transmission. You can never get the acceleration you wanted. So I took a car back to the uh, to the rental company and said I wanted something a bit, bit nicer. And they gave me a, uh, a Toyota Prius, which I hadn't even heard of before then. Uh, so you know, I soon found out about the hybrids, what they are and you know why it's got two engines. But what really blew me away was just how smooth it was, how how smooth the acceleration was, and you know how much torque you get, which is nothing compared to what we've been talking about with the Leaf. But, but at the time, compared to the uh, to the automatics that I've been driving, it was it was really nice. So I uh, I had that in mind for quite a while, uh, and then a few years later, by this time I have a family of five. We have two cars, one of which was a, a big seven seater diesel, which uh, which we bought new, and it had a um, there are two two clutches so it's a manual with two clutches the idea being that it's it's meant to be very smooth never particularly happy with it though especially the initial pickup when you try to pull away at a junction i'm sure we've we've nearly all been killed a few times because of that mm-hmm. so uh, uh eventually how do, how do you operate the, the second point. clutch <laughs> it's all automatic so you <laughs> just put your foot down and it's supposed to take care of it but it didn't really seem to add much eventually we we actually got to the point where we could go down to one car so we just kept the uh, the diesel for a while and i was just getting around by cycling so that was great uh, and then i uh, started working from home and i needed to get to airports a lot because of my work i thought we're gonna have to get another car and we thought about it and we realized if we bought a an electric car that what we would save on petrol or diesel could potentially actually cover the monthly cost for just, just the repayments it would effectively be a free car so i went around uh, looking at uh, dealers what, what prices and offers i had came across one particular dealer in gateshead so completely the other end of the country and they were doing a less than two year old leaf on three years interest free credit i can't remember the exact price but it, it came out just under what we were currently paying on petrol every month so we signed the deal we've got a train up to gateshead and my first experience of driving a fully electric car was driving at 300 miles home. Wow. So 
I was very conservative, stuck to 50 miles an hour on the motorways, which I now know was probably not the optimum. Um, I stopped every 30 to 40 miles because I had a 80 to 90 mile range, but in practice, it's a bit less than that. And then you need to keep a little bit in reserve just in case. And you need to also allow for the fact, you know, what happens if, if the next service station, the charge is broken. So it took me literally all day. I got home, I think just before midnight. So I could say I got home on the same day, but it was a great drive. And particularly that talk, it, it's not just talk. It's, uh, it reminds me of uh, Auto Man from the eighties. The robotic, not even robotic is uh, more of a hologram, I think. And then when he gets in his car, drives around a corner and the whole car changes at 90 degrees but all acceleration is instant and very much like that so yeah i couldn't go back at this point even though i've still got the diesel we have to drive it from time to time and it just fills my barrack <laughs> so that's my story nice nice i think one of i've done plenty of crazy things when i got the uh the leave for the few, first few months one of them was actually driving it all the way to edinburgh glasgow and then back so i basically did you know london uh all the way around not all along the east coast but a1 all the way to edinburgh nearly ran out in scotland um uh, because you know it's been too too happy to push it yeah all the rapid charges actually are free in scotland which is amazing i wish mm. i wish they'd done that in england weren't the uh, ecotricity ones free well, for a while they, they were at the time so one of the i can't remember whether it was my leaf or the uh all the one that i had on the sort of nissan electric experience or whatever they call it when they give you the car for the weekend to try it out when i drove it to leicester either there or the, on the way back i've actually I, i'm pretty sure i've stopped at, a, at every single one motor sta uh, motorway station on, along the m1 not because i've run out but you know although i think when you drive it 77 miles an hour um it runs out very quickly yep but i just wanted to experience it basically you know there was it was a new thing new shiny toy and I loved it. Yeah. What can I say? So since driving to Scotland, you've now decided to drive to Wales every year. Yeah. Well, there's, there's a conference there that happens to be, you know, in a nice spot. And what, one of the things that I do, one of many things that I do is I, I like to take loads of photos. Photography has been a bit of a passion of mine. And uh, when you have to bring your camera and things with you, like a tripod and a few other bits and bobs, just having it in your car makes more sense. It's just a convenience, really. And the funny thing is, the conference we were, we're actually both going to, I think I, the first time I decided to go there, I, I, I asked on the Nissan UK forum if there's anyone in Aberystwyth who's willing to, you know, give up their uh, three pig socket for my use or in the area. And, um, and somebody from the Aberystwyth University actually responded to me, hi Richard, and uh, and said, oh yeah, actually I work at the university. I'm one of the lecturers, so you know if you want to plug it, plug yourself in, I'll uh, I can arrange something at the university. <laughs> so I was like, why not? <laughs> so you know, I'm hoping uh, I'm hoping they're going to be uh, going to be as as uh, courteous this year as they were last year, and I hope the views by the seaside in the morning are going to be as amazing as they were last year because I've learned quite a lot in the last year. I think they're the same views. Well, you never know. The weather might be rubbish. <laughs> well, yeah, but I've learned quite a lot about landscape photography in the last year, and you know, it would be nice to put some of my uh, my newfound skills to use. We'll see. And I've got a better gear this year as well. Indeed, we will. So when you get there, you're sorted for charging. But um, I'm not sure that convenience is a word I would use to describe driving across um, North Wales in an EV. The, there's there's quite few. Well, yeah, I think Wales is a very strange part of our country. I believe the government, the local government, believe, believes in in um, commercial initiative, and also they also believe in a hydrogen. Not that I want to I want to open that particular bomb. <laughs> but they, the hydrogen <laughs> yes exactly but they they basically believe in hydrogen and believe in, in commercial installations with neither of which has happened not in the major way anyway there's, so there's there's quite a lot of seven kilowatt hour uh, charging spots along uh, uh, around uh, dotted around uh, wales but not many rapid charges which is a bit of a rubbish situation if you want to stop and have lunch and then drive on because you know rapid charges are pretty expensive to install yeah yeah, so I, I don't know what I'm going to do this year. Last year, basically, I drove all the way to Gloucester and then I I picked up a and &B in the middle of Wales with the charger, stayed there overnight and woke up in the morning and I 
uh, went up on some photography trip up in the middle bit of the uh, the Wales. I can't remember what the bit was called. And then drove down to the uh, university for the conference in the afternoon. Um, so that was my nice story last year. But I think this year I'm actually going to drive straight to Aberystwyth and because there's a few other bits of the coastline that I actually want to photograph. But that's going to happen in the evening or early in the morning. Basically, the thing about photography is that you have to either get up very early in the morning down to the coast or some location, stay up till the sun sets, because those are the times where the, uh, the light is in the best position. I'm going to combine both, but the, I might actually document the drive, either for my YouTube channel or um, for this podcast. We'll see. We look forward to being regaled by stories of your journey. I don't know. That might be riveting, right? Driving for uh, for two hours, then rapid charging for thirty minutes. Driving for two hours and driving for th- and charging for thirty minutes again. <laughs> I think the drive is something like six and a half hours altogether. Even if you drove a legacy car, I think all the charging is going to be about an hour and a half or two hours altogether. But you know, personally, I wouldn't drive for that long without any stops anyway it would be rather unsafe the the amazing thing about wales is that there aren't too many motorways at least the the route that i'm going to be taking so with this car's range when you do about 40 miles an hour through like a you know rural wales we could, i'm going to be fine i'm going to be able to do m- well over 100 miles, just around 100 miles to be on the safe side. So I should be fine. If you if you look at the uh, the Welsh map from the sort of Gloucester area, from the borders to Aberystwyth. It's not just the distance though. Uh, and one thing that I think people that haven't driven an EV before or haven't paid close enough attention to their petrol gauge don't realise is just how much of an effect the terrain makes on your range. That is that is true, yeah. If you're even just, uh, just where we are around here, which is a little bit hilly, not terribly, just going up into the hills can halve your range quite easily. And I would imagine that the hills and mountains in Wales would, would have an even greater effect. Although, of course, you do regain some of that lost energy on the way down. Precisely. That's the uh, that's the thing that uh, you don't get in the legacy technology cars. You know, you don't get the, uh, the range back when you drive down the hill. The petrol doesn't go back to the tank, which we obviously do have. Which is, of course, the idea behind a hybrid. Indeed. Or, you know, self-charging hybrids, as they, uh, they call them these days. I might actually um, document the trip, although I, I think these sort of trips, oh, I'm going to do 300, 400 miles in an electric car across the country. These things are no longer catching. So I don't know how, how interesting that will be. I think it's always going to be interesting. What well, One thing that really struck me uh, around the time that I got my car is it was that the economics made sense because the previous generation of electric cars were good enough, at least as a second car, that there were, there were viable options. Um, and they're coming onto the secondhand market at a very affordable price. So let's say for me, it effectively worked out as a as a free car. It won't work out exactly like that for everyone, but these have suddenly become very affordable. So I think a lot of people are getting into that market. And now, of course, we've got the next generation coming with much greater range. But in the meantime, we've still got a lot of these previous generation cars. And I think your one um, charges slightly more than, than mine, but still it's a comparatively limited range. So these sort of stories that will help people to overcome range anxiety, I think it's still going to be valuable for some time to come. Yeah, that is true. I've I think in terms of you know like uh, my own experience because we both live in the same town I quite often drive 80 90 miles away and then obviously I have to come back the car in theory <laughs> can do 155 <laughs> miles but that's you know if you drive 20 miles an hour on the level plane and there's no wind yeah that's not going to happen basically uh, in reality the car can do about 100 miles 105 miles if I drive carefully yeah uh, this might be interesting just for a we, we, unlike yourself you know I don't have any kids um, and we only have one car for the for the uh, for the household, and it's electric. In in my case, I can't remember exactly the figures, but the uh, the biggest motivator to get an electric car was a to upgrade to something cooler and shinier, you know, basically something that is more towards the future than a diesel. And uh, and also, I think it was roughly five hundred pound that I paid in all the uh, the maintenance and fixes of four year old diesel car. In, in the last year, which was mind blowing, the diesels don't like to be driven on short distances and uh, and you know loads of stops. So when you move to a city and you end up driving five mile stops at the given time, the diesel is just going to kill you. It's just not going to maintain itself very well. It's going to loads of things are going to fail. I think yeah. So this was my biggest motivation. But in terms of savings, I I, I seem to remember that we we maintain the same level of payments on leasing. Uh, the leaf compared to the uh, the payments that I paid for uh, uh, for the loan that I had 
for the diesel car. So effectively, I've saved roughly £90 in fuel every month, and I've saved however many pounds it costs me to insure the car every every year. I mean, I'm talking about the road tax. Right. Um, yeah, I think my insurance actually went down eventually. So, yeah, it's a very valid point because I think many people could uh, benefit from buying a second-hand electric car these days, especially if they don't do many miles and if it's just a runner-up around the town. For for example, during the week, we mostly run our car just, you know, to local shops and places to visit various people. So I plug in maybe once or twice a week, unless I have to go, obviously, further afield, in which case, you know, it's a different different scenario. Um, it depends on the, on the route. But I seldom uh, plan these routes anyway these days. There's so many applications and so many uh, different forms of charging. But I don't see any any reason why you're, if you buy a se- if you're in the market for a second-hand car now, or second car, sorry, in your family, I don't see any reason why you wouldn't pick up a f- fully electric second-hand 24-hour, 30-hour, uh, kilowatt-hour uh, leaf in our case or any other uh, electric car, there's plenty of them out there. And in fact, I was actually amazed that since the in the last year and a half, the 30 kilowatt hour leaf, which is what I'm driving, the second hand versions of, of those actually went up in value, not by much, but you know, it, it, you, hmm. you could, you could buy them a year ago for about 14,000. I think, I believe they, they went up to about 16,000. Obviously, that's a hearsay and it's local local news, but they maintain their value very well because there's uh, there's such a big there's much bigger demand for second hand car uh, EV cars now now than uh, than they used to be, and obviously the market's been flooded with the uh, the 24 kilowatt hour and now 30 kilowatt hour leaves by the end of this year, they're going to be released uh, uh, from the three year old or three year um, leases out there like mine. In fact, actually, I I had a phone call from the uh, the local uh, Nissan dealer today about. Uh, getting a new leaf so but that's a that's a subject for uh for, for another episode and um yeah i don't know what's gonna happen so i don't want to spoil it because i have no idea what's gonna happen myself <laughs> but potentially turning over a new leaf well the trouble with the the new leaf is that as, as you know um there's some issues with charging the rapid charging of the new leaf especially when you go on a longer distance uh journey i don't know how it would behave if i drove it to Aberystwyth. And also the, the the cost of leasing the the new leaves is actually higher, considerably higher than uh, than the one that I have. So you know we'll we'll see. Basically, it depends on what the dealer offers in terms of money and how. What... There's a lot of other differences as well. So I think we'll definitely have that discussion another time. Yeah, yeah. That's you know the the, the new leaf is is certainly a, a very good car. Um, I don't know if you've ever test driven one yourself. I have not yet. But compared to our leaves, it obviously looks much better. It actually doesn't stand out, which um, if I had one issue with the uh, the EV cars is that uh, for some reason, every single manufacturer wants to make them look futuristic, but they end up just looking a bit ridiculous. Funnily enough, and I'm not the only one to have said this, but the the Nissan Leaf is almost identical to the Nissan Juke. So very similar styling. But for some reason, the Duke looks very silly and the Leaf actually looks quite respectable. They're not the only ones to make this observation. So I think there's something in it. I'm I th- I... not quite sure what. <laughs> I, think, I think they took from animals when they were designing them because the uh, Duke looks like, like a hippo to me and this one Leaf looks like a frog. Um, that, at least that's my sort of, you know, uh, observation. <laughs> but anyway, the, the new one looks, unless you knew what to look for, you wouldn't be able to tell that it's an electric car. It it looks very much like mm. other cars in the uh, in the Nissan lineup, which I think uh, our our Leafs, you know, twenty four kilowatt hour and thirty kilowatt hour Leafs, that they looked style at least the style of the, the the car was the same as the sort of lineup of the uh, the Nissan cars at the time. But the uh, the trouble is the style did not change. It has not been updated in yeah. whatever eight years I think or no sorry seven years at least. I can't remember when the, uh, the the Nissan Leaf has been launched in Japan, but it's it's been a while. Well, it sounds like um, electric car styling is another topic for, for another show, I think. It is indeed. It's, there's a lot to talk about. So I think that's going to be it for this episode. And take it easy, people. Take it easy. I would like to thank Phil for joining me. And I would like to thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Please, if you have any comments, suggestions, follow us on facebook.com slash takeitev. 
subscribe to our podcast, obviously, on your favorite podcast catcher of choice. And uh, until the next time, all music and content in this podcast is copyright of Phil's and mine. You do need our permission to use any of it. Mm-hmm.